Well, I have a quote for you to begin tonight's lesson. And it reads like this from Catherine Ann Porter, who is an American journalist, was an essayist, a short story writer, and a novelist. And she says, most people won't realize that writing is a craft. You have to take your apprenticeship in it like anything else. So think about the professional field that you're in. And you all had apprenticeships in it. For instance, those of you in engineering, I'm assuming that you had an apprenticeship, correct? Where you had time that you did some project-based learning at a company or some other organization where you learned something of the craft. Those of you who are teachers, you have uh, student teaching experiences, which is your apprenticeship. Those of you who are in the nursing field, you have clinicals, which is the apprenticeship. Those who are studying to be physicians have the residency program for three years, which is their apprenticeship. And in the law field, uh, you practice as a what is an, an apprentice system. What is it? Uh, internships. Internships. So quite often, professional positions have some form of apprenticeship, and such is actually true in writing, because your apprenticeship allows you to master the tools necessary for the particular position or project you're working on. But here's the difference between writing and medicine or the sciences. Writing has no new discoveries to spring on us. We are not going to read in our morning newspaper that there has been a breakthrough on how to write a clear sentence because that information has been around since the King James Bible. And that's why quite often you'll see me even reference the King James Bible as we study our writing. We as writers have learned to this point now, we're in lesson six, that verbs have more vigor than nouns. In our apprenticeship, we have learned that active verbs are better than passive verbs. In our apprenticeship, we've learned that short words and sentences are easier to read than long ones. And we've also learned that concrete details are easier to process than vague abstractions. This is all part of our training in our apprenticeship. We also have learned in the last few weeks that we adhere as writers to simplicity and clarity in our writing. Uh, we all work with the same words, but these are basic principles that make for good writing. But what must we as writers also master in our apprenticeships? Writing is about making decisions as a writer. Countless successive decisions that go into every act of writing. Some are big decisions. For instance, what should I write about? And some are small decisions. Should I put a dash in here for an intended effect? But whatever the decision, large or small, they're important decisions because they affect the reader. Another thing that we've learned in our apprenticeship is that for us to learn to write well, we have to be motivated to do so. This is also true in our apprenticeship in our particular professions. If we have students in their apprenticeships that don't have the motivation to want to learn how to become the professional, that person's going to have a really hard time in the field. And the same is true in writing. If you remember the first week I said that I can't teach you how to write. You have to teach yourself. I can give you principles. I can give you guidance. I can be your mentor. I can be your guide but you're going to have to teach yourself. And after you've looked back on the 10 weeks of our writing course, and hopefully you'll see improvement in your writing. You probably will have a difficult time explaining how it happened, but you just know that it did. So here are some principles that we've, we are learning in our apprenticeship. And that is we let the reader peek over our shoulders. I've mentioned this, that readers should see themselves in your writing. It's called reader identification. If the reader finds himself or herself and can connect with you, it will keep the reader's attention. I mentioned this, that it is crossing points in your writing where the reader can identify with something that you've written. So that will be true in your character sketches. Not all of the readers out there will identify with your particular topic or your particular character, but you're thinking of a specific reader in mind who will. So you ask, all the time when you're writing, what's in it for the reader? What can I share? Now, I would like to ask some questions. And the first question I'm going to ask is, could you please share with us the title of your character sketch? And then who is your audience? 
because you are writing with that audience in mind, hoping to have this very thing, reader identification and a crossing point with that audience where they can find themselves in your writing. So I'm going to give you a few minutes because I'd like the off-site students to text as well. So I'm looking for the title of your character sketch essay, and I want to know who your audience is. And don't just say believers. If it's believers, just go a little step further than that and say, who did you have in mind as the audience for your particular paper when you were writing it? So if you need to write that down, fine. Again, I want to give just a couple minutes for the off-site students to text that to students here. start with and then we'll work it around this way Barry, turn it. all right whenever you're ready again the title of your character sketch and who is your audience the title of my it's very loud I don't know if it's good the title of my character sketch was John Mark from useless to useful and the audience I was thinking of was discouraged believers or believers that were discouraged from past failure and just using that character sketch as an il illustration of uh, how you can leave that behind and, and move forward and how God can use what was useless uh, in the future despite the past mistakes. So your audience really drove that essay, didn't it? Framed it. That helps to know who your audience is. Rebecca? Excuse me? Mine was called... Gideon victorious through faith and I my audience was also believers who were discouraged or feeling inadequate to do God's work and how um, God strengthens your faith and he is the one who's worth trusting and that he can do great things through you and give you the victory and with that in mind the audience in mind that motivates you to want to write well mm -hmm. doesn't mm -hmm. it Travis I did uh, Legion, or the Maniac of Gadara, however you want to call it, and I called it Legion, the Beloved Maniac. And uh, uh, the audience would be, you could, I could have written it to an unbelievers, but I chose to go with the believers and those who maybe feel like they're sort of, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to say out of control, but sort of just they feel like they're... Uh, maybe just feeling out of control or, you know, their life feels out of control or something like that, or they just don't feel like they have a handle on things. Mm. And just say the, the, it's just kind of a story that shows the love of God and pursuing and the value of people. Mm. And so. I look forward to reading that. Um, my title is Nehemiah, Building for God's Glory, and my audience is people in or aspiring to management or leadership roles. My title is The Proverbs 31 Wife, A Picture of All Forms of Wifely Excellence. Mm. My audience is the modern American wife who thinks she needs to do it all. Mm. My title is Joseph, Honest, Just, and Pure. And my audience is believers that face significantly difficult problems and need to seek to know and to do the Lord's will rather than to be calculating what is the best for themselves. Did we get anything? Thank you, Barry, for the off, from the off-site students. Um, Jen wrote on Peter, brazen, beaten, and brave. The new believer who is confident, but then the Lord humbles them, showing their inadequacy, grows them, and the renewed confidence that is true and pure apart from our flawed self-righteousness. So she wrote to the new believers. <laughs> she has alliteration in her title. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, Eric's title is John the Elder, Overflowing with Joy. He wants to share with us. His audience is believers who feel that they have a long way to progress before they are going to be happy or useful. Mm. Anybody else? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Looking forward okay. to all these. Um, Cassie is writing on Jonah, 
titled Swallowed Up and Spit Out by Pride. Okay. Well, if you get something later, you can mm -hmm. add it. Again, I look Sorry. forward to reading these essays. I'm going to read it. Um, I just read it first through, take it in, and then I go back in and read it as an editor and, and give you suggestions. But uh, thank you for sharing that information. We've also talked about the importance of being here and being live. The active voice brings immediacy to your writing. Uh, we talked about the fact that it's a basic structure of the subject, action, and result. The passive reverses that order. The subject of a passive voice is still the main character of the sentence, but sometimes else performs the action. So we always look at our verbs, and we talked about passive having a linking verb with a typically past participle attached to it. We've also talked in our apprenticeship about long sentences and short sentences. We've also talked about paragraph structure as well in reference to this. And it's interesting, but the emotional and psychological effect created by sentence length is huge. And if there's too many ideas in one sentence, the reader gets confused and sometimes gives up or thinks, I have to go back and reread that, which is something we don't want our readers to have to do. So we always take in consideration how to play long and short sentences off each other with intended effect. Last time I was here, I mentioned the importance of beginning, ending, and titling. And I said, essays that begin, end, and title well are usually well written. So my question is, did that surprise you? I still hadn't talked about the middle of the article, but I was talking about the beginning, the end, and the title. And I said, if those are written well, that essay probably is written well as well. Did that concept surprise you or not? It did not. Your thoughts on that? Where is the, anybody who wants to comment, go ahead and grab the microphone. I thought if, if it ties together the beginning and the end and it's captivating and exciting, usually you've got your points and you know where you're going. So if you can tie the front and the end together, usually the in-between content should be congruent and mm -hmm. fit. Right. And hopefully be interesting, too. If you, be interesting. if you can write a good intro and ending, then hopefully you can write a good in-between. And, and that's so true, and I'm so glad you see that. But unfortunately, many amateur writers, if you will, don't think of it that way. They don't think about the importance of the introduction. They don't think about the importance of the conclusion, and they... Lo and behold, don't even think about the title. If they put it on, they put it on the last second and just flash something on and off you go. Those are very important keys. Those are also important for you as speakers. So when you're giving a message, think in terms of your opening, think in terms of your close, and think in terms of your title. And as I mentioned to you, my recommendation is you write your introduction out, you write your conclusion out, and you also have a title attached, and then you can have bullet points in between as a speaker. But it's important that you begin well, and it's also important that you end well. And if you have your conclusion there in front of you, even though you're thinking, oh, I'm not going to cover all this material in my message, you think, mm, I'm going to go to my conclusion and I'm going to end well. Rather than say, well, I think that's it for today and we'll just pick it up next time. Uh, strategies to begin well include a startling statistic that works or state the thesis. We're going to talk about that tonight. You can provide an interesting quote or you can ask a question or even give a brief narrative. Stories work well to begin essays, even expository essays, even technical reports, because people like stories, and you'll catch their attention right away. I have some quotes from Writers Talking Shop. Uh, one was from Gabriel Garcia Marquez, who's a Col Colombian novelist and essayist, and he says, one of the most difficult things is the first paragraph. And once I get it, the rest just comes out very easily. In the first paragraph, you solve most of the problems with your writing. The theme is defined, the style, the tone. My question to you as writers, did you find that to be the case in your writing? Was the opening the most difficult part for you to write? Can you just share your thoughts on that? And I also don't mind text coming in as well. Somebody want to grab the microphone and give me your reaction? Was the opening the most difficult thing for you to write in this character sketch? I thought the opening was the easiest thing okay, great. to write mm -hmm. because I always start at the beginning and that was the part that I put the most thought into. Mm -hmm. And once I started, then it was like, okay, I haven't thought about the rest of it. And then I had to it. figure out and think as I went more than thinking about, oh, I'm going to start this and then I'm going to start like this. And then that's wonderful. So that, had that, that was my experience. For that. Some have a hard time because they write their essay or their article, and then they find the introduction in there somewhere. 
Did you have any thoughts? Anybody else have thoughts on that? Um, Cassie said that for her, it was the ending. Just awesome. was the most difficult. Mm -hmm. And also her um, paper on Jonah, she said that her audience is to believers who are discouraged and have failed. But personally, I think the beginning is hardest for me because that dictates where I'm going to go with my paper. So I have to be like if I, I have to be locked in on my intro because that's hopefully going to direct where my paper is going. So if I'm not very thoughtful about it, I just think the rest of my paper a lot of times is random or doesn't connect. Mm -hmm. And then I'm frustrated and then I have to go back to the beginning and try to like make it fit with what I wrote in the content. So the, tr yeah. the beginning is tricky e for each me. Each writer has a unique way of doing it. Some just write, do the free write, and then they find, okay, here is my introduction somewhere in here and they move that forward. Some don't write their introduction till the end. Some have to write it at the beginning, as you did. Any other comments? Okay, let's look at another quote. This is from William Zinzer on Writing Well. Remember, I gave you a recommendation of this book. This is his, and it's excellent information on how to write well. And he says, the hardest decision about any article is how to begin it. The lead must grab the reader with a provocative idea and continue with each paragraph to hold him or her in a tight grip, gradually adding information. Get the readers so interested that they will stick around for the whole trip. The lead can be as short as one paragraph and as long as it needs to be. So we've looked at various models. Some have their introduction as one paragraph. Some we've seen go into the two paragraph introduction. How many of you had the two paragraph introduction? Okay, most of you had the one paragraph introduction. Can't remember. <laughs> So when you are thinking about your essay, whether it's a personal essay, character sketch, or the expository informative essay we're going to learn about tonight, you think in terms of the grand design. And the grand design is this. How am I going to begin? How am I going to end? And then what is going to take me to that place? So what's going to be in the middle? And that's called the grand design, where you're thinking in your mind, all right, what's going to be the structure of this? And then quite often, then you find your title somewhere in there. But that's called the grand design of your paper, and that drives a lot of your decisions, as we will see tonight. Uh, the conclusion, when your reader gets to the conclusion, there should be that takeaway. What is the reader going to say? That was so helpful. That was so encouraging. I never thought of that. Thank you, writer, for sharing that with me. I mean, typically there is some response on the part of the reader by the time he or she gets to the conclusion. Leave writers with something that lodges in their minds. And then we have the conclusions. And I did mention last time I was here, introductions are hard, openers are difficult, but conclusions can even be more difficult. And I think Cassandra mentioned that. Because quite often we don't know when to end. So we come up with cliche endings. We attach to them. In summary, in conclusion, for the last thought, and the reader knows it's the last thought. So we try to move away from those type of cliche endings and think about how do I end well? These are the last thoughts that this reader is going to have in his or her mind. How do I want to end that? And then that last sentence in particular should resonate with the reader. There's different ways to conclude, and it depends upon your grand design. The long run is the idea that you made a statement in your thesis in the opener, and you took your essay to get to the final place of whatever decision that is. Um, the full circle means that you take from the beginning of your essay and you bring it around to the end. Sometimes even the full circle takes the title and puts the title at the end, the thought of it anyway, at the end of the essay. That's called the full circle. Some decide they're going to end with a startling surprise with the last few sentences. And the reader goes, I never thought of it that way. But that was really profound. And then some comes to a decision, meaning they put their thesis in the opener and they came to a decision in the close. The most satisfying essays are those in which the conclusion provides an interesting way of wrapping up ideas introduced in the beginning and developed throughout. A conclusion may inspire the reader to further thought or even action, may return to the beginning, or may surprise the reader by providing a convincing example to support a thesis. Here are some famous quotes for you. 
beginning and end shake hands with each other. That's a German proverb, and that's the idea of the full circle conclusion, meaning it felt complete to the reader. It felt like all the pieces were tied together. Um, T.S. Eliot says, in the end is my beginning. Again, the thought is that full circle conclusion. Most writers like that type of format. And of course, Shakespeare's quote, all's well that ends well. We talked about titling, and my statement to you the last time is ask a lot of your title. Don't just slap it on and say, I'm going to be done with it. You think about it because this is your first introduction to the reader. And the reader will make decisions whether or not he or she might be interested in this particular topic. So we do ask a lot of our titles. And we have different formats. And one is the why title. And I, uh, did I, I thought I picked up a why title. Nope. Well, I have one here. Uh, why must I be born again? The question title. I have some of those. How do you grow spiritually? This is by Pastor Roxer. Uh, the benefit for you give students is you are surrounded by models. You have the pamphlets, pamphlets in there. You have a bookstore of books. We have the Grace Family Journal. And I'm going to be bringing to you some models that I'd like you to read, but we're surrounded by them. The declarative sentence title. Uh, this is by the Warren Wearsby. The bumps are what you climb on. It's making a statement. The colon title. The usher. Servant and foot washer of the local church. We're going to see that tonight. That's Bernie Bishop's process analysis essay. I also have a note here that a subtitle, when needed, explains or restricts the meaning of the main title. We saw that in Richard Gearhart's David essay. He had subtitles throughout because he wanted to draw the direction of the essay and the movement of it. How many of you had subtitles in your essay? Did any of you? Okay, Gus did. I wonder if anybody off-site had those. But sometimes they work really well, and it worked well for um, Pastor Gearhart's because he had such a big topic of David, and he had to narrow the focus. Did you find that worked well for you, the subtitles? Did that get, give you direction on that? I just found I only had eight verses to write on, but I still, about 75% of the way through the paper, I found that I, I came back and added subtitles just because I felt like it helped me to be more concise and to stay on point with those subpoints. So yes. I just used it as a way to identify the subpoint of that particular section I was working on. Mm -hmm. So not necessary, not necessary, but it looked aesthetically, it looked nice too, yes. in the sense that it broke up the page a little bit with some italics. Mm -hmm. And I think it just introduced what that section, maybe it was going to be one paragraph, maybe it was going to be three, but what that section was going to be about. Mm -hmm. And I, I hadn't done that before, and I find that I liked it enough that I'll probably do that a lot in the future. Yes, and they do work well, and I appreciate that you brought that up about the audience, too, because the audience likes that, because they, oh, look at what this section's about. And so they study that, and then they see the next section. But you're making those decisions as writers, I know Barry was talking to me. He said he was going back and forth between having subtitles or not, but he thought, you know what, I don't want to break the flow of this particular story. So then he, he took the subtitles out. But again, you're making that decision not for yourself, but you're making that decision for your readers. Oh, finally, finally, now I'm going to talk about the middle of your paper because we talked about the beginning, we've talked about the end, we've talked about the title. So now let's talk about the middle. And the middle section of an essay is inseparable from the opening. The middle explains and develops the thesis, and organizing a long article is just as important as writing a clear and pleasing sentence. And we're going to see that writing is linear and sequential, especially when it comes to the expository essay that I'm going to teach tonight. It's the logic of the, it, it, the logic is the glue that holds it together from one sentence to the next, and from one paragraph to the next, and from one section to the next. And that narrative keeps on going, and it pulls your reader along. So for the readers, the only thing they should notice is that you have a sensible plan for your article. Uh, they're not going to say, oh, I just love the grand design of this article. But they certainly want to feel that they're not being lost and left along the way. And that's why it's so important, writers, that you have transitions. So you think about, how am I going to flow from the introduction into the middle, into the body of the text? 
How am I going to flow from one paragraph to the next, sometimes from one sentence to the next? And as a result, I have provided you with a handout where it has tr transitional words that you can think about using. Um, they're called connectives as well. But they're needed when the direction of the essay is turning or when an idea is paralleled or contrasted with an earlier idea. The more formal your essay, the more formal becomes your transitions. So if you're writing a very scholarly article, I'm going to probably see quite a bit of conjunctive adverbs found in there. And you know what conjunctive adverbs are because we studied that in grammar class. The therefores and the howevers and the consequently. Um, so again, it depends on the, the nature of your article and it depends on your audience and how you're presenting it. But you can't have your paragraphs transitions or your sentence transitions choppy. You want it to have that very smooth rhythm throughout that keeps that reader going. So the handout hopefully will be helpful to you as you think about transitions that you might use. Here's a quote for you. I mentioned this last time. This is something I don't want you to forget. The essence of writing is rewriting. So we examine the opener, the close, the title, the middle. So we write, and you're fortunate in this class because you write your first draft, you turn it into me, I give you feedback, and you get to go back and write it again and rethink it. And then it ends up in the portfolio. But writers quite often go through many iterations of work when they're writing articles or books or pamphlets. And it's sometimes very difficult to submit the final copy because there's always something you think I could have improved on, but there comes a time where it, it has to go. But the essence of writing is rewriting. In fact, uh, here's an interview with Ernest Hemingway. The interviewer said, how much rewriting do you do? Hemingway, well, it depends. I rewrote the ending of Farewell to Arms, the last page of it, 39 times before I was satisfied. Well, was there some technical problem there? What was it that had stumped you? Getting the words right. I'm sorry, the formatting didn't come out the best on that. It must be different um, programs we're working with here. But <laughs> Ernest Hemingway had to rewrite his last chapter 39 times. He still didn't think he had it quite right, but he knew he had to turn it in. So that's the idea that we have as writers is that we know that the essence of writing is rewriting. And maybe in the past you never thought of that way. In the past you might have submitted your papers to your instructor. You got a grade, maybe some comments, and that was the end of it. You tossed it off and there you went. And didn't go back and review it, rethink it on how it could be better. Here's another quote from Patty Shavesky, who says, I've cut some of my favorite stuff. I have no compassion when it comes to cutting, no pity, no sympathy. Some of my dearest and most beloved bits of writing have gone with a very quick slash, slash, slash. These four pages out because something was heavy there. Cutting leads to economy, precision, and to a vastly improved text. So here's my, tech, my question to you as writers. Did you find that was true in this particular essay that you wrote? Or did you write something that this is not sounding right, this isn't working well, off you go, delete, 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 try it again. Was that an experience that some of you writers had? I'm seeing yes. A few comments, please. You all said yes to that, so. <laughs> Thoughts, but it doesn't fit anything, and you really like it. Right. <laughs> but it just doesn't, it just doesn't flow. It just doesn't And then you flow. get, you do get frustrated. I, I don't know, I have compassion on myself, so it's hard for me to cut stuff. <laughs> For all of us to but cut our it, words. it is better. It's mm -hmm. freeing when you get rid of it, and it sounds better. But I don't know. Yeah. It, I'll go ahead. And another comment. I am. I've always been a huge fan of the red pen because <laughs> I always thought it made it better um, to look at it from that perspective of does it work? Does it not work? Does it communicate what I want it to communicate? And well, are the words right? Mm -hmm to get the right meaning across, to get the right kind of meaning across and with the tone and everything that you're shooting for. Mm -hmm. And with this last essay, first draft, it was very much more of the write the sentence, 
see that it doesn't work, and then try and figure out what I am trying to say. Mm -hmm. And then try again and again and again until I figure out what I'm trying to say, and then trying to find the way that I can say that in the best way possible, which you sound like haven't got that far yet. Yes, <laughs> no, you always sound like writers, because this is what writers do. You just don't quit write it, and off it goes, but you agonize over it at times. And you think, oh, I really spent a long time writing this, but it's just not working. So off it goes. <laughs> All right, let's move to our third essay, which is going to be expository writing. So we've had the personal narrative, we've had the character sketch, and now we're moving into expository writing. Expository writing is informative writing. Its primary goal is to explain. The second goal is to persuade. And the whole point is to have your reader say, yes, I understand now or I'm convinced now. So when you embark on an essay of this nature, you may know exactly what you're supposed to do and how best to do it. And if you do, you're fortunate. <laughs> but most of us don't. The entire concept of writing an essay could be fuzzy at the beginning. So today's lesson is to bring into focus the what and the how of expository or informative writing. Keeping in mind its primary goal is to explain So it's interesting because most of the world's prose falls under the heading of expository writing. When you write an article, or you write a final examination, or you even have a lab report, or you write a legal brief, you are writing, in essence, expository writing because it's writing to inform. To get information to the reader, we have to have a sure sense of audience. That's at the top of the list. You're going to keep hearing me say that time and time again. If you ignore the special character of the audience of your informative essay, you might as well not even begin it. Now, this type of writing differs from the personal writing we've done. And personal writing really fell into two categories for us. It was your personal narrative testimony, and it was a character sketch. Because it's going to differ in its purpose and the way the reader is going to use the information. So you think, how am I going to know how to write this type of essay or article? My recommendation is you are surrounded by them. We are so fortunate. These are just a few of the Grace Family Journals that I brought along with me, but I want you to know that they are filled with expository writing examples. We have pamphlets as well to which we can refer, and you probably have shelves of books that are informative in nature. So what you do as a writer is you find some that speak to you as writers. And you study them for the craft of how they set it up, how they transition, and how they close. Now, I've all been asked questions about length as well. And my recommendation on these essays is don't give readers of an article or pamphlet more information than they require. If you want to tell more, then you have to write a book or a scholarly article with a specific audience in mind. So when you look at the articles that are in the Grace Family Journal, and some of them came from my former students, most of the students submitted essays were anywhere from, I'd say, 5 to 7 to 9 to 12 pages in length, but max was 12. Most of them ran about anywhere from 7 to 9 pages, but some had even less than that. So you're going to find those type of examples in the journal. So read informative articles and write one like them. Informative writing is to explain, not so much a matter of opinion, but you're convincing yourself you are a teacher if you're writing process analysis, but you're informing with integrity. And in argumentative writing, you're seeking to persuade. An argument is a point of view with reasons to back it up and intentions to sell itself to others. Most of the articles we see here in that fall under argumentative and within this argumentative framework, we'll find, oh, that's a comparison contrast structure, or that is a cause effect structure, or that is a process analysis. But in many cases, it's set up as an argument because an argument means to persuade. 
to move people to agree with you to sell your position to the audience. One of the things that I'd like you to do within the next two weeks is read Paul's argument in 1 Corinthians 15, which is his argument of the resurrection. Beautifully crafted, beautifully written, with examples and proofs. And you probably know that chapter well. But Paul was faced with this. Um, Corinth was a Greek city, and the Greeks did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. So when Paul preached in Athens and declared the fact of Christ's resurrection, some of his listeners actually laughed at him. You can read that in Acts 17.32. It says, And when they had heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, We will hear you again speak on this matter. Well, with this skeptical attitude, it somehow invaded the church, and Paul had to face it head on, so he wrote this argument regarding the truth of the resurrection. And he presented three proofs in there. Now, proof number one was their salvation. Proof number two was the Old Testament scriptures. And proof number three was Christ was seen by witnesses. And when you read the chapter, you'll see a couple of therefores in there, which means that he's writing in the logic format. And when you look at the very last verse, verse 58 in that chapter, he comes to his conclusion. So if you would read that in the next two weeks, and we'll come back and we'll talk about it. And I do want to talk about his conclusion at the end of that chapter. So we see argumentative writing in Paul's work as well. Think of another book that falls into the argumentative structure. Can you give it to me, of Paul's writing? Yes, the book of Romans. And if you recall, I mentioned when we were studying Gibbs Grammar, it's a book of logic. So as a result, you see a lot of therefores throughout the book. So he has different formats based upon his audience, based upon his purpose, based upon his intended effect. When we were in 2 Corinthians, oh, this was probably four weeks ago, we were talking about that book. What kind of style or tone was 2 Corinthians? What do we refer to that book as? Rebuking. Rebuking. And also, he wrote it as a personal narrative as well, didn't he? He talked about his own story. So, it, again, it depends upon his, his topic, his audience, his intended effect, his purpose. So it's interesting to study the various writing styles of the Apostle Paul with that in mind. Argumentative writing seeks to persuade, establishes a positive relationship with the audience. Just because we use the word argue doesn't mean that we take this confrontational point of view. No, no. We want to persuade. We want to win over and convince our audience so we don't want to sound confrontational as a tone. We want to sound certainly knowledgeable about the topic that we're writing about, but we also want to sound convincing, and we want to have that right tone attached to us so people aren't going to turn us off in the process. So we're going to think about this final essay that you're going to be writing, and the four organizational structures are the grand design because expository writing falls into four categories. You can have comparison contrast, Thinking about your topic and deciding, is that going to work? Is cause effect going to work for me? Is process analysis going to work? Or am I going to go strictly on the argumentative format or design? Organizing is a strategy that grows logically out of your topic and your purpose. So let's talk about these four organizational strategies. And I want you to think about what could potentially be your topic for it. As soon as you can think about it, the better. I'm going to give you some suggestions right now. You could write on a topic that perhaps you have spoken on, and you think, you know what? I want to take that material, and I want to put it into a written format. That works well, actually, because there is a very great similarity between writing and speaking, but yet it is different. So you think, I'm going to take something that I spoke on, and I'm going to turn that into a written text. You can think in this term, um, someday I would like to speak on this topic, but I'm going to first start on the written side of it, and I'm going to write it. It could be a topic that's of particular interest to you, and you already can think of an audience who is going to benefit from this information. So start thinking right now, as I'm going over this material with you, it's going to be an informative. What's going to be my topic? And then as I'm thinking my topic, 
what type of organizational strategy would work best for this topic. And one could be the comparison contrast when we compare or examine similarities or we contrast differences. When you think about the topics in the Word of God, contrast abounds. Can you think of some contrasts, two topics that are very contrasting ideas? Could you give them to me, please? Can you think of some? I'll, I'll, if you want me to start you out, I can. Grace, grace and works. In Adam and Walking by faith, walking by sight. In Adam and Christ. What are some other ones? Light and darkness. Life and death. The word of God abounds in comparisons and contrasts. So thinking about your topic, it might lend itself, if you have two that you're talking about, to the comparison contrast. Now, there are various ways you can set it up. You can say, all right, I'm going to have my introduction, and the first half of my essay is going to be point one. Transitional paragraph. The second part will be point two with my conclusion. Or you might decide, no, within my paragraphs, I'm going to compare and contrast and go back and forth that way. You decide as the writer what is the best format that you're going to use and what options you have. So you could do subject by subject pattern, or you could do point by point. Uh, for a somewhat longer essay, you might consider the point by point pattern. It would work better. I have, yes, I have an article that I looked at from the winter 2015 Grace Family Journal. If you want to jot this down, if you want to read one, it's called Is Victory Earned or a Gift? That was under the comparison contrast model, and it was Charles G. Turnbull, and it was the winter 2015 edition of the Grace Family Journal. Perhaps your topic would lend itself to what we call causal analysis. You could talk about the causes of some event and its effects. Um, if you're going to do that, you would want to have your cause and effect within either the same paragraph or one paragraph could be cause, second could be effect. I have an article for you to read if you're interested in the cause-effect analysis and what does that look like and how does it set up. And here it is. It's Why I Am No Longer Free Grace by J.B. Hickson. It's the winter 2013 edition. Why I Am No Longer Free Grace, J.B. Hickson, winter 2013 edition. I could stand up here and I could teach you the organizational structure, but the best way for you to learn as writers is to go in and read it for the craft. Study it, pull it apart, see how they organize it, and see how it fits for you. And then there's another option for you, process analysis. When I went through the articles in the Grace Family Journal, when I looked at the pamphlets that I have at home from the Gospel Press, Grace Gospel Press. Many of them fell within this model. Process analysis. Process analysis is a model that says, I'm going to teach you something. And I'm going to take you along, and I'm going to show you. It falls under argument. It falls under persuasion. But it uses a different kind of format. It uses a far more conversational tone to it. And you are teaching somebody something. If I were going to be standing in front of a group of teachers. I would say to them, there's eight ways that people learn. And here they are on the PowerPoint slide. They learn when you give an overview. In the opener, you let them know what you're going to teach them or what you're going to share with them. You give examples a lot. You use for example and for instance. Use analogies. Remember, analogies are similes or metaphors or comparisons so that we can take the abstract and we can make it concrete in our thinking. You tell the reader what not to do as well as what to do. You tell the reader why. You use imperatives a lot in this format. You use the second person you a lot. Before I told you you shouldn't be using that, but in process analysis you need to. That's your connection with the audience. That's your reader identification. You seek to persuade, and if needed, you can even use pictures, charts, or diagrams. To give you an example, 
of process analysis. I have provided you with um, some examples in the handouts I've given you. But here's one right here by Pastor Sean Bachman. And it's 10 principles to ponder when the unexpected happens. Informative essay, argument under the process analysis model. Let me read you his opener and show you how this works. Listen to the tone, listen to the audience. When the unexpected happens, what are you to do? How are you to respond? It happens every day. Someone, somewhere, gets news that is not welcomed and is hard to receive. A relative is killed in a car accident. The phone call from the doctor tells you that it is cancer. Your seemingly healthy child contracts a debilitating disease for which there is no cure. Your son or daughter serving in the armed forces is hurt or killed. It can crush you instantly. It is devastating and can rip your guts right out. Second paragraph, as a believer in Christ, you are not exempt from problems and difficulties. If you stop to think about it, there is not really very much that you are in control of. Some things are obvious. You cannot control the weather. You are not in control of the other driver, though at times you wish you were. You cannot control the actions or attitudes of another person. There is very little you are in control of. But the one thing that you are in control of is your attitude and your response to adversity, even when the unexpected happens. There was a two-paragraph introduction. He identified with the audience right away. He used the you a lot. He grabbed a hold and said, when the unexpected happens, here are some suggestions that I have from you from the Word of God. Come with me and let me show you. That has been so effective in uh, many of the models that we see that we read. Here's another one. This is from Pastor Roxer, and it's Planting and Establishing Local Churches by the Book. This is an informative essay, if you will, longer one. It's under the process analysis mode, and you will see that he uses you a lot in here. It's that connection with the audience. Uh, here's another one that he wrote. Uh, how do you grow spiritually? Again, it's the uh, question title, but he uses a process analysis essay, reaching out to the audience with a you, second person point of view. So again, you're making these decisions as a writer, considering your topic and considering your audience, what model you're going to use. The process analysis answers the how questions. How am I going to cope when the unexpected happens, so to speak. So Sean, the writer, takes us on that journey and answers that question. Uh, sometimes it's how to lead a youth group, how to be an effective Sunday school teacher. When I was teaching in 2009 to the Gibbs students, um, Bernie Bischoff was in my class, and he says to me, Carol, uh, you know, I'm an usher, I'm the head usher, and I've been meaning to write a pamphlet on how to be an effective usher in the church. I said, well, now is your time if that's what you want to do. And off he went, and he wrote it, and it's in one of our editions of the Grace Family Journal. So again, you're, you should be excited about your topic because this is a piece of information that you want to share with others. Again, you're deciding what is the mode that you're going to use, organizational mode. And then maybe yours is just strictly an argument. You have a thesis, and you're going to defend it. But you want to move people to agree with you, so your tone is going to be so important. You're going to have to have a belief in, with reasons to back it up. You're going to have to sell it to others, and you're going to have to persuade your reader. So what is at work here? Oh, my, the tone of my writing is going to be so important. Because, again, I don't want to be confrontational, but I want to be helpful, I want to be informative, and I want to support my argument. So at the end of the article, the reader is convinced. Now, sometimes the reader might not agree with you, but the reader says, those are... I certainly will take to heart what they say with you from the beginning to the end. So again, you have these choices. Comparison contrast, cause effect, process analysis, or an argument. Whatever we do, we're going to look for energetic alternatives to the five-paragraph essay. Uh, in times past, you might have heard that that's how to set up your essay with an opener, or the introduction, or the close, and have three paragraphs in the middle. Well, that sounds fine, but it doesn't read fine. 
It reads too structured, it's too predictable, it's too formal, it's, it isn't reader friendly. And so you notice with these articles that I bring to you, they're not set up in that format because they're set up with the idea of what is my, who is my audience, what is the intended effect, what is the purpose, and how am I going to get there. So we're going to stay away from that, and we're experiment with personal narrative, dialogue, and humanizing techniques. Now, outlining can be fine, but you have to be careful with that so you don't become so rigid you don't sound like a real person writing it. So you have to have that correct tone in your writing to bring that reader in. Thesis, audience, purpose, and tone. There are some statements that I want to leave with you that when I'm no longer your teacher here, you're going to think, I just keep hearing Carol Helland mention these terms to me um, all the time. And this is one, thesis, audience, purpose, tone. Can we go back now? What are some of the things that I want you to remember after I'm no longer your Gibbs teacher? Writing is first, what is it? Creative then corrective, okay? Good writing is aware of its audience. Show, don't tell. The essence of writing is rewriting. rewriting. And when you get into an expository essay or speech, this is what you tell yourself, okay? Thesis, audience, purpose, tone. Thesis, audience, purpose, tone, meaning I will have a thesis statement, either in my opener or my close. Who is my audience? What is my purpose, my intended effect, and what tone am I going to use that works with this particular piece of writing? Thesis, audience, purpose, tone. I have not talked about thesis statements to this point. I will now when it comes to informative or expository writing. A thesis statement is simply this. It's a one sentence, declarative sentence, statement, summarizing what your essay is all about. You can find it in this opener, and it's usually the last sentence in your opener. And if you put it there, you're telling yourself, OK, I'm going to use deductive reasoning. I'm going from the general to the specific. Or you can be doing inductive reasoning, where you put your thesis statement at the end. <clears throat> but it should appear somewhere in your writing. Here are a couple that I gave as examples from articles I read. Abraham, a man who couldn't wait. It read like this, since the promises of the land were given to Israel by the Lord, it is apparent that the solution to the current unrest can be found only in the word of God. Mm. The writer just made a claim, and the writer must now defend that thesis, and the entire essay then unfolds with that thesis in mind. Here's another one. This came from the seed of Abraham. Bible-believing Christians are blessed through Abraham's seed, who is Christ. Okay. Now, the rest of my article is going to be, how are Bible-believing Christians blessed? And I'm going to come up with points. I'm going to say to myself, am I going to have three points in this essay? Am I going to have five points? But I don't want to have too many. Because if I put too many points in my essay, my reader is going to get lost. So it depends, again, on your intended effect driving those decisions. Here's another one. So if somebody's reading in Jude 11, and here's how the verse goes, woe unto them. For they went in the way of Cain and ran riotously in the error of Balaam for hire and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. Taking that, if I'm going to write an article on this, thesis could be individually Cain, Balaam, and Korah and speak of particular aspects of what it means to, fail, to fall away from the truth. Together they present a complete picture. See what I did there? I was able to get away with one sentence, though I had two ideas in my thesis, and I used the semicolon to do it. Now I'm still legal. <laughs> Typically, we don't do that, but if we have another one I need to get in there, I can do that and attach it in that way. So when you're writing a thesis for your particular article, you ask yourself questions. OK, is this worth saying? Does it narrow my topic to one main idea? Does it make a claim or assert an opinion? Can I support it by details, facts, examples, certainly verses within the limitations of time and space? Does it stimulate curiosity and interest in the readers? Am I using exact language? Uh, I'm like repeating myself. Here. Does it not include anything that you do not intend to discuss in your article or essay? And is it one complete declarative sentence, usually with one independent thought? OK. Thesis. When you are reading the examples that I have given you, I want you to look at their openers, and I want you to see 
their thesis and see if you can find it. Take your highlighter, take your pen or pencil and underline it and see how they include the thesis in the opener. Okay, thesis. Second thing I say to myself, audience. So in my informative essay, I write to a specific audience. Second guess readers' needs, which will determine tone, diction, sentence structure, and mode of argument, which narrows my audience. And each audience has to be talked to in a different way. Okay, question. This audience right here. How does this audience need to be talked to? Gently. Comforting. Very carefully. Because somebody's going to pick this up who something unexpected happened and they don't know where to turn. How do I grow spiritually? Who do you think the audience is for this? New believers. So again, that will drive the tone and the intended effect as well. Thesis, audience, purpose. OK, my purpose is my intended effect. What do I want to do to the reader? How do I anticipate the reader is going to respond? These are not good purpose statements when you're writing something. Just to complete an assignment, just to get a good grade, just to write a good paper, to learn about topic X, to practice researching, thinking, and writing. And you don't have to raise your hand on this one. But in times past, has this been the purpose? And if it has, it's difficult to write well when this is the purpose. Just to write the paper and get it done, hopefully get a good grade, I'll hope for the best. Um, to learn about topic X. What should we as writers and Gibbs have as our purpose? Again, it depends on what we're writing to, but it's the intended effect. And I was listening to the character sketches, and most of you said to encourage, to encourage, to encourage, to encourage. I heard it, that going around. And that would be considered a purpose statement, to encourage the readers, uh, to the readers not to give up, to fight the good fight, to continue on. So the purpose, you need answers to questions. Why am I writing this? What do I hope to accomplish? What's the task this article sets out to perform? What use is the article to the reader? Those are all purpose questions. Thesis, audience, purpose, tone. Thesis, audience, purpose, tone. When you think about tone, you think about the writer's voice. Tone is the emotional mood of the writing, and it's described by the adjectives we use to describe people's moods or personalities. You can have a gentle tone in your writing. You can have a formal tone. You can have a conversational tone. You can have a professorial tone. You want to sound very academic. You can have a casual tone. Again, it depends upon your audience and your purpose. But the first rule of writing, you must have one. You must have a tone. The reader must feel like there's, the tone is emanating from your writing, that he or she is connecting with that. Because writers who don't have one are boring and they're disconnected from their audience. You must sound like a person with a living, distinct personality. And if you write like a robot or you sound like Siri, you're going to bore yourself and your readers. And quite often, people who are writing never think of tone. It doesn't come to mind. Because they think, well, tone isn't that chosen for me? Isn't it determined by topic? Tone is determined by purpose. What are you trying to do? What tone will further that cause? And the more tones you have at your command, the better your writing will be. Writing everything in the same tone is as impractical as using the same, hitting every golf shot with the same golf club. If you are golfers, you know you wouldn't do that. But as writers, will we do that, use the same tone? No, because we know writing all of our work in the same tone is going to be boring. So we learn the importance of tone in our writing. Tone is not determined by writer's personality, determined by purpose, and tone matters, sometimes even more than content. Wow, explain that one to me. Tone sometimes matters more than content. Can you explain that? Why would I make a statement like that? Do you agree with that? 
trying to pick up the microphone or content can be good but if they're coming across in a way that is totally turning off to you you're just going to shut off to what they say correct no that's exactly true so we have to keep that in mind every piece of writing has an effect an emotional feel an unstated message and that's why again i go back and i reference the tone of this particular article which is very comforting tone and it has the identification i've been there and I, this is what I've learned from the Word of God. All right. Here's what's going to happen in the next few weeks. I am not going to give you a writing assignment to turn into me in two weeks. We have two more sessions left after this. Um, our last session, I believe, is June 4th. And I took some time thinking about this. That I want my students to read articles, but I want my students also to think about what is the topic that I want to write to, because this is an important piece for you as students. It will follow you into your expository preaching course as well, learning these elements. So I thought, okay, with that in mind, I'm going to push out the expository essay to June 4th, and then the portfolios do then, but the expository essay then won't end up in the portfolio for final revision. The only way that it will is if you want to send it to me or someone and say, Carol, I want to keep rewriting it. Tell me what you think, and I certainly would help you with that. I just want you to spend time reading, thinking, and then doing this right here. You write notes. You write research. Maybe you already have something written because you have spoken on it, and now you want to turn it into a written piece. And you just begin dumping your ideas onto paper. You empty your head, if you will, and you write as fast as you can. Don't stop on your topic. So with the research that you're doing, the scriptures that you're referencing, you're just writing. I call that the first drafts. Uh, most people experience an awkward and sometimes paralyzing translating process in writing. And they say, let's see, how shall I say this? But this is called free writing, which helps you to learn just to say it, just to get it out there. We're not worried about the corrective side of it. We're just worried about the creative side, and we're getting our ideas down there. And then we're going to learn about the format. So in light of writing your ideas, then you look at what structure do I want to impose on this essay? Am I going to impose the grand design of a comparison contrast, a cause effect, a process analysis, or is this going to be strictly an argument? So you look at it and you make those decisions as a writer. You ask yourself, what do I keep now? What do I throw away of the stuff I've written? And the more you have, the better it's going to be for you. Uh, how do I sequence my research? What, how should I say this? Should I put this piece of information in or not? And then the all-important question, what tone am I going to use? The better purpose, the more it answers such questions. Then you move into your draft two. Your writing becomes more precise, even draft three. You go through the text, take everything out that shouldn't be there, and then you see what to cut. And then it turns out that by the time you get to June 4th, then you say, okay, this is the best it could be at this point, Carol. I'm turning it over to you now and asking you for your advice as my instructor and as my writing coach and mentor. And when I give it back to you, I want you to know that this is a labor of love for me. And I'm not in any way trying to put you down in your writing. I'm here to help you. And I'm here to show you that all these writers that I bring up, this is, uh, writers talking shop, say, I am so thankful for somebody who goes through and reads my work and sees what's not working and what is working and gives me suggestions. So quite often the editors are like what you're seeing from me. So all good writers go through this process and they go through these drafts. And you will learn the most about writing from the writing I return to you. So the notes that you see on my side, my recommendations, how sometimes I just take things and give you ideas of how to make the transition smoother or how to be more clear or precise. This is where you really learn how to write well. And this is an element I cannot take out of a writing class. I could stand up here and teach for hours, but it comes down to you're doing the writing, then you're getting the feedback, and then going back and rethinking and rewriting. And that's how you learn how to write well. The fourth, fifth, tenth drafts, whatever it takes. Uh, don't be satisfied until every word is carrying its weight, every sentence moves the reading because writing gains strength in subsequent drafts. If you remember back to the very first lesson, I gave you four tips on how you can write well right now. 
and one of them was to read like a writer. I was just having a conversation with my husband on the way here, and he said, Carol, he said, this course has changed the way I read. He said, I find myself when I'm reading articles or other text, I'm now reading like a writer. I'm looking at how they open, how they close, how they transition, how they're pulling me in, what examples, analogies that they're using in illustrations. And I, it has changed the way that I read because I'm looking at it from this lens now that I indeed am a writer and I can improve my writing by looking at how other people have done it. This is a quote from uh, Charles Moran, and he is a teacher, writing teacher, I think it's at Yale. He says, when we read like writers, we understand and participate in the writing. We see the choices the writer has made, how the writer has coped with the consequences of those choices, what the writer is doing. We have written ourselves and know the territory, know the feeling of it, know some of the moves ourselves. So we look at it again through the lens of we are writers and we're reading another writer and seeing how they're doing it. And we learn from that. And so you'll find quite often, I'll go through articles and I'll be highlighting, I'll be taking notes and I'll reference that. And as a result of my doing that, it affects my writing. And there comes a time when you shed the skin of the writers that you enjoy reading, but still they have a profound effect on your work. All good writers have gone through this process. Nobody's been solo in this. We learn from each other. We are in a community of writers, if you will. And here's part of our community. So when we're reading like a writer, we ask questions. We ask, well, what is the author's purpose? Who's the author's intended effect? What about their language? And what kind of evidence do they use and quote from verses and personal anecdotes or personal stories? And here's an important one I want you to know when you're reading the Grace Family Journal. How do they cite their articles? Because you will note, as you read the informative articles, how they are cited, and we follow the same format with ours. I also have an example that uh, came from a former Gibbs student in the last Gibbs cohort that shows you how to reference that. So again, I don't need to spend time teaching this. We have examples and models in front of us to show us that. Uh, this is handled differently than maybe some of the MLA work that you've done in the past or APA formatting. So I wanted you to be able to sure to reference what you see here in the Grace Family Journal. Yes. Is style this is um, the literary style and this also follows the, the history. Um, those who are history majors follow this style as well. Yeah. But great way for you to learn. Just check how they reference the bottom of each of these informative articles. And again, I gave you examples in your handouts as well. Uh, so here are all these questions. Now, read like a writer. I spent some time and I went through some of the Grace Family journals and I came up with some articles that would fall into the various models that I shared with you tonight. If you want to pick others of your own, go ahead, but I recommend reading at least three these models. And you might want to select some that you think, you know what? I'm going to use comparison contrast, or I'm going to use process analysis, or I'm going to use cause effect. So those are the type of articles that I'm going to read. So you have a list in your uh, PowerPoint slides. And I chose different topics intentionally based on the audience of students that I have to read this work. There's one article I certainly want you to read, and it's in there, and it's Bernie Bischoff's The Usher, Servant and Foot Washer of the Local Church. Um, it was in the spring 2009 Grace Family Journal. He wrote this article for my Gibbs composition class, and it found its way there, and now I believe it's used in the church, or is this not a pamphlet used for ushers? I believe it is. Um, my question is, I'm going to read the opener. Who is the audience, and what is the organizational model he's using? Do you remember the first time you attended church? Hopefully you were met at the door by an usher with a warm greeting. Ushers serve to make people feel welcome and to maintain order among the crowd, keeping confusion and interruptions to a minimum. Here's his second paragraph, still part of his opener. 
Perhaps you have been asked to serve as an usher, which means someone has probably recommended you. What is needed to fulfill this role? Since the ushers in a local church serve a local body of Jesus Christ, an usher should be motivated by the love of Christ and empowered by the Holy Spirit. This is what makes his serving different from an usher at a football game, opera house, or circus. I've been an usher at my local church for 12 years and would seek to offer you some helpful tips. Okay, question. Who's his audience? Okay, what's his organizational model? Process analysis. He's teaching. And remember, if you see you a lot, you see imperatives, you're in the process analysis teaching mode. So he chose that as his model. Where's his thesis? Yep, the end of the second paragraph, right? I have been an usher at my local church for 12 years and would seek to offer you some helpful tips. And then he goes in and he'll, body of text, and he'll give you the helpful tips. So right away, he identifies with its office. Okay, next question. Thesis, audience, purpose. What's his purpose? Educate. To educate those who are going to be ushers. Oh, here are some tips to help you to become an effective one. Thesis, audience, purpose, tone. What's the tone? Instructive and encouraging and more even conversational in tone as well. So he's not intimidating me. I'm thinking about being an usher, so he's giving me some tips, and he's not building that wall like I know so much, and I'll bring you along. This is very conversational. And also, I wanted you to notice, he starts almost like a, with a, say that, Gus? It's a, question. it's a question. He starts with a question opener. Do you remember the first time you attended church? And you're thinking as a reader, indeed I do. Hopefully, you were met at the door by an usher with a warm greeting. So you go back and you think about that. Ushers serve to make people feel welcome and to maintain order among the crowd. So he tells us what an usher does, keeping confusion and interruptions to a minimum. So please continue reading that article on your own. I have another one. Um, this is What is Free Grace Theology by Dr. Michael Halsey, uh, excerpted from Chapter 1 of Freely by His Grace. This is in the Grace Family Journal. I believe I found this there. Here's his opener. Theological disagreements about the content of the gospel are at least as old as the events recorded in Acts 15 and the book of Galatians. The latter is a polemic by Paul written to defend the good news of grace and salvation apart from works. His words are sharp as he pronounces scathing anathemas on anyone who would change the content of the gospel as the false teachers were doing. First paragraph. Second. A few years before Paul denounced the false teachers who had by stealth moved into the Galatian situation, Jesus condemned the Pharisees, most notably in Matthew 23. Christ's disagreement with the works-oriented religious leaders of his day continued throughout his earthly ministry. One might say that theological disagreements are as ancient as when man was east of Eden, as evidenced by Cain and Abel's approach to the Lord in Genesis 4. The debate continues as represented by three positions concerning both the content of the gospel and its ramifications. Arminianism, Calvinism, which manifests itself in what has been called Lordship Salvation, and the free grace position have drawn their theological battle lines. What type of format does he have? What is his organizational model? Compare and contrast. And he also is in the argument mode, too. He's seeking to persuade you. You saw that his thesis statement is the last sentence of his second paragraph, which now we're done with his opener. And there's another thing I want to point out to you. He uses the system of triads. And again, I said triads work really well in sentences. In some ways, we just think in terms of triads. If you're an artist, you know that that's a form that we use when you're designing. And he uses the triad in his thesis of this. Um, let's see. I'm going to the very last sentence. OK, the Arminianism, Calvinism, and the free grace position. So those are his three triads. He's going to continue to pull those out now and speak about that within his text. And I have one for us to look at um, the next few weeks. And this is from Ian Roxer. He wrote, uh, Pray Without Ceasing, Practical Tips on Personal Prayer. This was his um, essay. And when you look at it, over the next two weeks, I want you to examine his thesis, his strategy, his strong evidence, his clean narrative line, and persuasive close. Here's, excuse me, would somebody read his opener? 
I have it here, but I'd like somebody to read it. And I want you to answer the questions for me regarding his format, his organizational strategy, his audience, his thesis and tone, just by looking at the first paragraph. Go ahead. Five years ago, I was listening to a recorded sermon by Kurt Witzig, a teacher at Duluth Bible Church. Think of the most important activity you do on a regular basis, he said, pausing for a moment. Okay, keep that idea in your head. Now, how much better would your life be if you did more of that activity? After this thought-provoking question, Kurt proceeded to deliver a message about the importance of personal devotions. This impacted me. I had spent time in personal devotions every day since my youth, yet I was not satisfied with my personal prayer life, which was inconsistent and anemic, generally used only in times of obvious need. Go on, please, because this is the rest of his uh, opener. Thank you. I'm convinced that many believers find themselves on the same sparse island, unable to escape. Knowing the value of prayer, desiring to be a faithful prayer warrior, but always falling short of the glorious ideal of a prayer-filled life. What you're about to read helped to bring me off that island. You will not find here a comprehensive discussion of the doctrine of prayer, but you will find five points of practical advice that may help you draw closer to your God through regular personal prayer. Okay, thank you. The question is, what model, organizational model is this? You can tell right from the opener. It's process analysis. He is using you, reaching out. He's also going to move into some imperative sentences. Um, what's his thesis? Did you find it? The very last sentence of the second paragraph. Thesis, who's his audience? Believers or, yeah, like, how do I have a quiet time with God or the importance of devotional life? Thesis, audience, purpose, tone. What's his tone? You can tell from the opener, and it is what? The tone is coming alongside. I'm going to hear it to help you, and it's very conversational. Now, notice that he's going to use subtitles in this particular essay. Uh, they are know your audience, weigh its value, set aside focused time, keep a personal prayer list, make the glory of God your objective, and then he closes as a result. Could you please turn to the fourth page? This is just the opener and the close from Jim Miller's The Bible Bears Witness. He set this up as an argument essay, but look within the mode he used. Would you find it odd if a complete stranger approached you and passionately tried to convince you that the recorded works of Aristotle were all falsified documents? He starts with a question. Odd and unlikely? Yes. But an equally antiquated book, the Bible, has long been the target of similar and often far worse assault. Many an inquiring college student has taken a Bible as literature course looking for answers, only to have doubt and bias cast upon him or her. As if that weren't enough, hundreds of scathing blogs exist, accompanied by swarms of personal animosities to discredit God and his word. The Bible is no stranger to attack. It has weathered battles regarding its validity since its inception, and therefore one must wonder at the enduring uproar surrounding this odd book. This debate forces the critical mind to consider the Bible's origin and reliability. Each individual must be the judge and jury as he or she objectively considers the evidence and puts the Bible on the witness stand of truth. Opener, he has a thesis. He has an argument essay, no question about it. But it's interesting, he also uses what kind of format? Can you tell? I'll give you a hint. Look at the close. <laughs> you, he's in the you mode here, isn't he? So he's setting up an argument, but he's also bringing in the audience, and he's moving in that sec person per, second person pronoun, you. So he's bringing in that process analysis, if you would. So it's it, just an interesting twist on it. You have to decide what's going to work best for you, considering your topic and your audience and your purpose and your intended effect. So as we think about the next few weeks. This is what I'd like you to pay attention to. Uh, I want you to read the Pray Without Ceasing and the Usher for the May 21st discussion. I want you to select some essays in all of the compendium of essays that we have.
to read like a writer. I'd like you to read Paul's argument, 1 Corinthians 15. Then I want you to consider your topic for the expository essay, because I will be asking that, at least knowing what your topic is. And then you just research, take notes, free write your topic. In the meantime, don't forget about the personal narrative you have, that you're looking at and you're revising for excellence in that. And that will find its way into the portfolio. So everything is looking to that June 4th date. June 4th, I'm going to be submitting the expository essay, you're thinking. And I'm giving the portfolio to Mrs. Helen. And within that portfolio is the revised personal narrative and the character sketch that you're going to get returned in two weeks. I also will talk to you next time about a letter that I'm going to ask you to write in the portfolio. So my suggestion is to work with something you already have. Uh, work with something that you've used as a message, or work with something that you have written and you want to refine it. So that, those are my thoughts. Do you have any questions about what lies ahead for us? Yes. I guess not what lies ahead, but um, can we talk about thesis mm -hmm. some more? Um, after reading Bernie's two-paragraph and then uh, thesis, it has me questioning that I don't know what a thesis is anymore. <laughs> okay, let me go back. I don't understand how his is a thesis. I have been an usher at my local church for 12 years and would seek to offer you some helpful tips. It sounds like a transition. It sounds like it doesn't need to be said. It doesn't sound like it's making a point. And maybe you'll so just need to go on and thesis? read the rest of the essay and see, because he's leading you now into those tips that he has in an usher. So he chose that his validity, I'm an usher for 12 years, and he's going to seek to offer us some helpful tips as an usher. So that's his thesis. He's making that claim. I've been an usher, and I'm going to show you the way of how you might consider what works for an usher as well. OK. okay so the we claim another would be? One too? Do you remember my reading this one? Where is it? Three's grace. There is the one. You see the last sentence? of the second paragraph. Yeah. But not completely it? clear. Yeah. So he's going to flesh out the Arminianism, Calvinism, and the free grace positions in his particular essay. But thank you for bringing this up. And when I come back next time, I'm going to spend more time on thesis. OK. How's that sound? Yep. Remember what I said uh, regarding Sean, here's was his thesis, last sentence, second paragraph. The, but the one thing that you are in control of is your attitude and your response to or response to adversity, even when the unexpected happens. There's his statement. Now he's ready to launch from there. So here's what I recommend: when you go through and read articles for the craft, that you look at their openers and see where their thesis is. Sometimes their thesis is at the close of their article, but most put it as a last sentence of their opener. Do you have a question, Gus? I just want to. OK. Isn't it fair to just say that some people? Isn't it fair to just say that some people, when they're writing, are, are more direct about what they're going to try to accomplish in the, in the following body of the, the writing? And others leave it a little bit vaguer, more more vague, um, that you can sense here that he's going to contrast these different positions, mm -hmm. but you don't know exactly what the concluding idea is going to be, what conclusion he's going to reach. Yeah. So it's a little more vague than Ian, of course, says. I'm going to give you five. He, I'm going to give you five yeah. points, and and Bernie is it's more of a purpose statement than than uh, I would say a thesis in the sense that he's saying, I've been, I've been in this position, and I'm going to give you some feedback. He doesn't say how many points. He just yep. uh, some tips are going to follow, yep. and it will lead you to then read further. But I think that's the confusion is that you think of a thesis, sometimes you're thinking about like a debate thesis or something like that mm -hmm. that's very, spe very and, specific. And I appreciate you saying that. Again, it depends. The thesis depends on your audience, the tone, and the format, the organizational format you're going to use. So he's in the teaching mode because he chose process analysis. So he is in the teaching mode, and his sounds like teaching. I've been an usher. OK, he has experience as my teacher. And I'm going to seek to offer you some helpful tips. And there's his thesis. So he's going to take us gently in there. If it's a far more academic essay, argument essay, as we see in the one 
on, on the, uh, the free grace, then it takes a more formal approach. And he had three areas specifically that he was going to deal with. Uh, Ian's had five. He said, and then what he did was he used the subtitles, the five. He pulled them out. He said, okay, I'm going to have these as subtitles just so that my reader remembers them. And that worked effectively for him. So again, we make these decisions as, as readers and as writers. So when I come back next time, I really would like to know your topic. And it will help if you do have your thesis statement, because I can help you with that as well. And then we can just talk about it further. But I'm not going to ask you to submit anything to me formally until well, it's about a month from now. So is that going to work for you? Because I want to be very mindful and helpful to you as students, too. I don't want to put a lot of pressure on you, because I do want you to write well and spend time thinking about it. So is this going to work? OK. So my plan is I'm going to enjoy reading your character sketch essays. And I'm going to bring them back and give you some suggestions on them. And then we'll continue on where I left off. And next time I return, I'm going to talk about the corrective side of writing. So I'll see you in two weeks. <laughs>